Okay, guys, I'm here today with John Danaher. Huge honor for me. Guys, uh, John, we just shot an entire structure all about the strangles and turtle breakdown. That's part of the Go For The Fastest Fundamental series from John. And today, John is going to show us here what are the three most important jiu-jitsu strangles, jiu-jitsu chokes in jiu-jitsu. And I'm very excited to learn from him. So, okay. what was John? Um, first off, we got a little explaining to do, Bernardo, because... Uh, in and North America, James uh, Jones. <laughs> <laughs> um, normally, people refer to uh, attacks on the neck as, as chokeholds. Okay, and uh, that's the standard method in, in the United States. Um, and people often ask, well, why, why do you call them strangleholds? Like, uh, you, you must understand there's a difference between choking, which is an attack on the airway to the lungs, versus strangling, which is an attack on the blood supply to the brain. Um, think about this uh, in, in everyday terms, Bernardo. If I asked you to hold your breath, you're a good athlete, and I'm sure you could hold your breath for at least two, maybe three minutes. And with some training, you could probably go even beyond that. Um, so by stopping air to the lungs, by holding your breath, you can retain consciousness for pretty long periods of time, two minutes, three minutes, in extreme cases, all the way up, I believe, beyond five minutes. Uh, but there's no one in the world that can train themselves to stay conscious during a stranglehold, okay? Stopping the air to the lungs is one thing, and it takes quite a long time to make someone pass out using that method, versus attack on the blood supply to the brain, which will render anybody unconscious in a matter of seconds, usually between 6 to 12 seconds, depending on the stranglehold and depending upon the opponent. Um, so you can see that qualitatively, there's a complete difference between an attack on the air to the lungs, which takes a very long time to take effect, and an attack on the blood supply to the brain, which takes very little time to take effect. Um, understand that all of the hardware that's been attacked in a stranglehold is in the neck. And the neck is a very curious part of the human body when it comes to the sport of uh, jiu-jitsu and, and, and martial arts in general. Um, the average male human neck is somewhere between 14 to 19 inches, depending upon their level of athleticism and size, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, a world champion black belt like Bernardo might have an 18 or 19 inch neck, and someone who doesn't train at all and physically diminutive might be around 14 inches. There's a lot of hardware inside that very small circumference. Uh, inside that circumference, you've got two carotid arteries going up to the brain, carrying around two thirds of your blood supply. You've got two subspinal arteries going up the back, bringing about a third of your blood supply to the brain. You've got a jugular vein bringing blood back down from the brain, back to the heart. You've got the trachea, the, um, uh, the passageway for air to your lungs. There's a lot of very, very valuable material based inside that very small circumference. Inevitably, as a result of this, whenever you go to attack one of these things, you will inevitably attack the other. So if I put a major stranglehold on, your, uh, on an opponent, the compression around the neck will simultaneously block the, uh, the blood supply to the brain, or at least partially block it, and it will probably have a secondary effect of also stopping you from breathing, just because the trachea is positioned right next door to the carotid arteries. So an attack on one will inevitably be an attack on the others as well. But please understand, when you close off both the air passage to the lungs and the blood supply to the brain, the blood supply to the brain will kick in and have an effect long before the air supply to the lungs. So you're passing out from the strangle, not from the, the choking effect. Uh, a simple way to think about chokes is they're typically things that occur at the dinner table. You eat your food too quickly and it goes in the wrong passage and you start choking, okay? Um, you can stay conscious under those circumstances for a long period of time. Uh, contrast that with a stranglehold, which is applied you're unconscious in a matter of eight seconds. Um, so it's important we understand uh, the anatomy of the human body and exactly what we're trying to attack. Anytime we go to, to uh, attack our training partner's necks with uh, uh, one of these holds, it's always the stranglehold that we're looking for. There will be an indirect attack on your opponent's breathing just because everything's packed together in a very small space. But that's not the target of the attack. The target of the attack is always the um, uh, the carotid arteries, and that will have that will give you the effects you're looking for—an efficient way of putting someone to sleep in a very short period of time. Um, 
so that's the the story of why I, I talk about strangleholds rather than, than chokeholds. It, it's more precise. That's really what we're looking for: is the stranglehold, uh, the attack on the blood. Um, now, with that in mind, let's uh, start answering your question, Bernardo, which is a very interesting question. What are the three most efficient ways to attack uh, uh, strangleholds in, in, in the sport of Jiu Jitsu? Um, let's talk about that right now. Whenever we work with strangleholds, we need to make a distinction between naked strangles, which are done in the nogi context, and strangles utilizing the collars and the lapels, um, which is done when we're wearing a jacket. Uh, let's understand the jacket and your sleeves, which can also be used for strangleholds, exactly what they are, for exactly what they are. They are force multipliers, which enable you to take whatever strangle potential you have with your naked body and massively multiply it using the cloth, okay? Um, if I have a training partner in front of me, let's understand that when I go to work with a naked strangle, the instrument of a naked strangle is going to be your wrist and forearm and bicep, etc., etc. So if I'm behind Bernardo and I work for a given stranglehold. When I come around here, you'll see that I have to use my forearm to penetrate underneath my training partner's uh, jawline and then lock up and go into the stranglehold. That's a pretty big uh, uh, instrument to try and put underneath uh, a skillful defense. If my opponent has his chin down low, it's quite difficult for me to penetrate through underneath and get to my training partner's uh, uh, neck. In these cases, I may well have to go over my opponent's mandible and strangle in a slightly less efficient fashion. Now let's contrast that with our training partner's jacket, okay? You will see that the jacket has a collar and a lapel which go around it, which is remarkably similar in construction to a belt, okay? It's a little thicker and a little stronger, but the the general pattern of it is rather similar. And you can see that essentially your opponent's lapel functions like a rope around the neck, okay? And just as a rope can be used as a beautiful instrument of strangulation, in fact, probably the most efficient strangulation instrument of them all, so too your opponent's lapel can be used in a similar fashion since it's almost the same thing. When you think about the purpose of the jacket or the construction of the jacket rather, you'll understand that essentially it's a rope sewn into a pair of sleeves that your opponent has on his body. Okay, so the gi has a rope that goes around the head and neck and this is woven into a pair of sleeves and once you start to identify it in that fashion, you will start to see it for what it is. An incredible instrument for strangulation. Okay. The other key, if we bring the camera in close, is to understand the nature of this, uh, this jacket. It has a flat side and it has an edge, just like a knife. Okay. Now, as you know, a knife has a very sharp edge, which is very dangerous, and it has a flat surface, which is not really dangerous at all. So too with strangulation. Whenever we go to strangle, we want to use the incredibly hard and sharp edge of our training partner's jacket to turn in so that even when my opponent defends the neck by pointing the chin down, you will see that thin edge easily penetrates underneath the jaw. If you contrast the thickness of the edge of the collar with the thickness of my wrist, you'll see my wrist is massively thicker and therefore less efficient as a penetrating instrument to get underneath my opponent's chin. But when I turn the lapel down and lock it in, you will see it penetrates easily underneath an opponent's chin, no matter how strongly they, they set their defenses, okay? In addition, this edge is extremely hard, and as a result, it forms a very, very strong strangulation instrument. When we lock in here, it cuts underneath our opponent's neck and becomes a very, very fine instrument for strangulation indeed. In this sense, by exerting whatever strangulation pressure we have, over a much smaller surface area, you're multiplying the force that you can effectively apply to your opponent's carotid arteries. There's another very important element when we go to use the, uh, our opponent's jacket. When I'm behind my opponent and I lock up a rear strangle, if we bring the camera on this side, you will see that my head has to be right next to my opponent's body in order to go forward and lock up the stranglehold, okay? That puts a very strict limit on how much of my body I can employ in the strangle. 
because we're locked head to head with each other. This pretty much restricts me to the idea of what we call a rotational finish. That's the best finish I can use from here, right? Go to rotate my elbow over my training partner's shoulder. And that's pretty much the best that I can do. It's good. It's certainly more than enough to strangle someone, but it is not nearly as good as the kind of forces we can generate when we take advantage of our opponent's jacket, okay? When we sit up and work from this position, bringing a camera on this side, when we work with the benefit of a jacket, regardless of how I go to grip my training partner's body, whether I use the legs, the wrist, the opposite lapel, in all these cases, I now get a unique ability to turn my body out to an angle where my head moves away from his head. Remember, in naked strangles, I have to put my head right next to his and maintain it there. And as a result, I can't really use body weight as part of my strangle, because wherever my head goes, his head is joined to it. But when we go to strangle with a, a jacket, I can, under these circumstances, throw my leg over my training partner's shoulder. And then from here, I can use a push of my leg on my training partner's shoulder. So for the first time, I'm utilizing the strength of my legs as opposed to just the rotational power of my shoulders. We're now using the incredible power of the legs to push into a stranglehold. Secondly, I can use my body weight. As I push with my leg, my body weight moves out to the side. As my head moves further and further away from my opponent, I'm using a combination of leg strength and falling body weight to massively increase the power of the strangle. When I'm locked in a naked strangle with my training partner, like so, I cannot use falling body weight. My head is locked to his head. Wherever we fall, we fall together. I cannot use the strength of my legs in the strangle, only the rotational ability of my upper body. But when we lock in here on a training partner, and I turn to an angle and bring my foot across my training partner's hip and lock my leg over the top, from here I can use the pushing strength of my right leg and at the same time fall away from my training partner so that now we can employ body weight and leg strength to create a fantastic strangle effect. In this sense, the gi is the greatest force multiplier that you can use on your opponent's body to enact a strangle outside of a murderer's rope around your training partner's neck. It's the next best thing. And understand the gi, as I said earlier, for exactly what it is. It's a rope around your opponent's neck woven into a set of sleeves. Once you start to see it in that light, you will learn to trust in that collar, in that lapel, to put on far more efficient and far more powerful strangles than you could ever hope to do with a naked strangle. Always learn to use that, that rope around your opponent's neck whenever possible. Understand that there is a place for the use of naked strangles, even when my opponent is wearing a gi. It's not wrong to use them. There are occasions, and I will discuss this in the video, where it is appropriate, even with a gi on, to use naked strangles. It, it does happen occasionally. But in the vast majority of cases, I strongly urge you, if your opponent's wearing a jacket, or you're wearing your own jacket, you want to use your sleeves, we'll discuss that soon, use it. It's there. It's a force multiplier that will turn a good strangling situation into a great one, okay? So again, the idea is that when we get behind our opponent, when he ducks his chin, that will make naked strangles very difficult, okay? But it will not make it difficult for me to turn a lapel down and take the edge, never the flat, always the edge of our training partner's jacket. And it will always penetrate underneath even the most soundly defensively set chin, okay? If I use the flat and he goes down, that will not be an effect of strangulation, okay? So I wanna turn everything down and then lock so that the edge cuts underneath our opponent's defensive chin. Then from here, we wanna take advantage of two things, leg strength and falling body weight. So as I pass my leg over the top and put my leg over the shoulder, I now get an ability to push Bernardo's head into the strangle using my legs. Then at the same time, my falling body weight out to the side means that we can hang our body weight off our training partner's lapel and create incredibly strong and efficient strangles, far more so than we could ever dream of doing with basic naked strangles. My students are famous for their ability to get behind their opponents and strangle in the no-gi context, and they have an elaborate system which they often use to get the job done no-gi. But please understand that the act of strangling with a jacket on is radically different. I don't teach one back attack system for strangles, I teach two. A no-gi one, which is world famous, and a gi one, which is 
soon to be revealed in this video. Um, it's very important that you know both, okay? Because I'm telling you now, if you limit yourself to no gi strangles, you are missing a whole world of opportunity which awaits you when you work with a, a, a jacket on. And you will find the strangulation potential of the jacket far exceeds the strangulation potential of naked strangles, okay? There's, it's an exciting world and you will greatly benefit by learning this, uh, how, how to use this incredible force multiplier, the jacket and uh, the lapel that, uh, that makes it such an impressive strangulation instrument. Now, when we go to work with our opponent, let's understand that we're both wearing a jacket. His jacket is a fine strangulation uh, mechanism and so is your own jacket. It's important we be able to take advantage of both. There is no question in my mind that when it's time to learn the gi strangulation game, there are many forms of strangle that I could show you, but I could show you too. We could go through all day and show you a thousand and one methods of strangling with the jacket. And most of those methods are interesting. They eliminate some interesting principles about Jiu Jitsu, but you're not going to use those strangles. Okay, the evidence is very, very clear. There are a small set of strangles in modern competition which account for about 95% of the successful strangles. My advice to you is focus on that small set. Okay, I would rather know a lot about the three or four main forms of strangulation that account for 95% of the successes than to know a thousand and one strangles which I might use once in my career. Okay. I'm not interested in strangles I use once in my career. I'm interested in strangles I use every single day I'm on the mat. And if there are three strangles which have consistently shown themselves to be the leaders when it comes to the statistics of success with strangulations with a jacket, it's pretty clear. Sliding collar strangle from the back, or kiri iri jime. The cross collar strangle from the front, juji jime. And the Ezekiel strangle from both front and back, sodi guruma. So, the sliding collar refers to any situation where you're behind your opponent, chest to back, we lock up, and from here, we come in and strangle. You have three main choices. There are others, but the three main choices will be second lapel, wrist, and pants, okay? You can do this with hooks in. You can do it without hooks in. There's a bunch of ways you can do it, okay? And they all have the same principle. The idea of getting to our grip, and locking up like so. And then from here, removing the slack from our training partner's collar, if we use the double-handed grip, or taking away defensive hands, if we use the wrist grip, or maximizing the use of angle by turning out, by grabbing our training partner's uh, uh, pads. In the vast majority of cases, this will involve you taking your feet from the conventional feet in the middle position, which is often used for naked strangles, and instead substituting a foot across the hip, like so, and then a leg over the shoulder. This leg over the shoulder gives you the angle to employ your body weight, and it lets you use your leg as a pushing instrument so that I can push my opponent into the strangle. Okay? There's a sense here in which what we're looking to do with all of the sliding collar strangles is to create a strangle pressure backwards and a pushing pressure forwards so that our opponent's head is pushed forward into the strangle so that you get a coupled force, a force coming back and a force pushing forward. And when we can do this and all the variations that we look at, that combined force creates four enormously powerful strangles, which we'll be looking at in this video. Now the second, if that's the number one killer from uh, the, the strangle game, there's a close second, and that would be Jujijime, the cross collar strangle. Um, a million variations, but what they all have in common is the idea of a strangle hand that comes in here and a finishing hand that goes over the top and be placed inside, outside, or what have you. What this does is it creates that same kind of rope like effect from the front, which enables us to cover our training partner's carotid artery. So you can take a seated position in front of me. Adam. The idea here, seated. Similarly, as we saw with that idea of a rope around our training partner's neck, if we come in here and lock up 
and we get our hands as close together as possible. This creates a rope-like effect on our training partner that creates enormously strong strangles, okay? Think about the kind of strength that your hands can employ when you climb a rope, okay? You throw a rope up to the ceiling, you can go hand over hand and pull yourself up. You can apply tremendous gripping strength to the rope, okay? Far more so than you could with any kind of naked strangle where you're grabbing your own bicep, etc., etc. And that's exactly what's happening here. We're taking advantage of that rope-like effect of the jacket. We're getting our hands set in good position and we're employing the same kind of grip strength potential that we use when we're climbing a rope to lock in our training partner and find that strangle, okay? When we, sorry, when we come in here on a training partner, we want to get our grip, if we bring the camera on this side, and then from the situation, get our hands relatively close together and our head in good position. The further my head from my opponent, the more Bernardo can put hands on my body and create distance. What we want is ear to ear position with our training partner. And from here, we can enact a very, very strong stranglehold indeed, okay? We'll be looking at a bunch of ways from a host of different positions to use this incredible stranglehold from the front. Now, the next strangle we're going to look at is probably the third most effective strangle in modern day competition. This is the Ezekiel strangle, Sodi Guruma. In this one, I don't use my opponent's gi, I use my own gi. In particular, we go in and use the sleeves of the gi. And this is going to create situations where either in front or behind our opponent, we can create a very strong push-pull effect on our opponent to create superior strangles. So if I'm behind Bernardo, for example, and we have an arm going through underneath my training partner's arm. A common problem we run into, even when we work here, is our opponent's defensively set chin. And even with the, the jacket, it's not always easy to go in against world-class competition. The beauty of Sodi Garuma is that we don't have to penetrate underneath the chin, okay? All we need to do is come through and get to a grip where my thumb comes all the way up to my training partner's carotid on the far side. Okay, here I'm showing the version from the back, which is probably the more commonly seen one in modern competition. It can also be done from the front. We'll cover that in the video, don't worry. From here, I want to make sure I get a good second knuckle deep grip on my own jacket. Try not to come in with the shallow part of your fingers. That will create a lot of stress on your fingers when you go to apply a strangle on a tough resisting opponent. So let's make sure we go to the second row of knuckles and even better, all the way up to your punching knuckles. And that way, your grip will be nice and strong. You'll have a robust grip that won't fail you when you go to strangle. Now from here, our whole thing is to take our hand over the top and place it in like so. Now, it's all about the movement of my head away from my training partner. And let's understand we have a pushing hand, which is secondary, and a pulling hand, which is primary. Most of the strength of the strangle comes from the pulling effect. A common mistake here is people put the hand over and they try to push and they find they always have a weak Ezekiel strangle because they're pushing. The real key is to hold him with the pushing hand and let all the power come from the pull. It's that pull that works the magic. One of the beauties of this strangle is you don't need to have the classical two hooks in. Very often in these circumstances, it's more than enough just to have a single hook and have, be off almost to an angle with your training partner. This is an incredibly valuable strangle in a scramble. Um, that's a tongue twister, huh? strangle and a scramble. Um, from here, we go through on our training partner and lock up. I don't even have two hooks in. We're in a scramble situation where I don't have perfect back alignment. And all we need to do from here is bring the hand around the corner and set it. Now, as Bernardo goes to work his way out, I just focus on that pull underneath my <coughs> armpits. Oh, and we go in there and get the strangle hold. Common mistake here, people focus too much on the push. They try to push the guy into the strangle. But that makes a strong, resistant body. That'll never work. So we just lock that blocking hand in. I block with my push hand, and I focus on the pull. And that's where the strangle comes from. It's almost like a karagatame done with the, uh, the extra help of the, of the jacket. So there's no question in my mind, Bernardo, the three big killers on the mat will always be the sliding collar strangle from the back, the cross collar strangle from the front, and the Ezekiel strangle from both front and back. Um, the primary focus of this video is gonna be on those three for a very simple reason. They account for about 95% of the successes that you see in modern day competition. I will cover other strangleholds, I promise you, but I want you to focus the lion's share of your attention on the incredible strangle potential of your opponent's lapel 
and your own sleeves, because that's where the majority of your successes are going to come from. So those are the primary uh, uh, strangulation tools that we'll be looking at in the Go Further Faster Strangle system. Yeah, no, John, I love it. And uh, I agree 100% if you like, uh, why focus in the other strangles if uh, they're yeah. like 5%, yeah. you know? Like, yeah, so. you're hardly ever going to use them. Yeah. No, and uh, I agree 100% as well when you said that uh, this the Ezekiel from the back is like a modern choke because yeah. modern struggle because uh, I remember I learned that when I was brown or black belt when I was like white blue really? purple belt I would not even see people yeah. doing that and yet now in modern and nowadays it's it more time. common than the Ezekiel yeah. from the yeah. front yeah. no and uh, I think it was very well chosen the three most important strangles. And uh, guys, we just shot this entire structure with John, all about the turtle breakdowns and the strangles. And it came out really, really good. John shows all his systems for strangles and for the turtle breakdown. And uh, I think like, is, uh, as uh, I read the quote another day, another day that uh, the arm you can choose if you're gonna attack or not, right? Arm, knee, ankle, not the neck. but uh, not the neck. So, <laughs> and I love how you explain like why the strangle happens. Yes. I had no idea that it had so many <laughs> arterials. <laughs> when you think about it, the, the single greatest weakness of the human body is the neck. Yeah, Think yep. about all the major organs yep. in our body. The heart and the lungs are protected by the ribs. Yep. The spinal cord is protected by the spine. Yep. But the most vulnerable parts of the human body, the carotid artery, the jugular vein, have no protection whatsoever. It's just soft skin yep. between the most <laughs> valuable uh, uh, circuitry elements of the, of the human body. The only thing between the carotid artery and your strangulation arm or the gi is skin. Okay, so this is an obvious weak point of the human body. It's a, it's a major design flaw. Um, so you have to learn to take advantage of it. Okay, you, you've got to make this your, your number one target in fighting uh, uh, or, or grappling. Get to that neck. And as we've just talked about, uh, submission to a joint lock is always a choice. But to a stranglehold, if you choose not to tap, you're going to lose just by passing out. Um, I'm, Bernardo, I don't have to tell you this. At the top levels of the sport, there's people out there that just don't tap. They're, they're, tap. they're more than willing to let things break. You get to the gold medal final, there's 20 seconds left on the clock. Yep. They're not going to tap. Yep. They're going to let things break. And yep. it's actually pretty common. Um, there's also people who budget breaks. that They know enough to escape. They get damaged, but they know just enough to escape where the yep. damage isn't catastrophic and they can keep fighting. Yep. They'll feel it tomorrow, but they're good enough to get through the match. Yep. And they, they budget on this. And so joint locks have a hard time succeeding against such people. They might work 100% of the time in the gym where it's a much more relaxed atmosphere, but much less successful in the gold medal rounds of, of world championship competition. But strangleholds are not affected by this. They, and yeah, it doesn't matter choose. how brave the guy yeah. is. It doesn't matter how physically tough he is. He just passes out. So strangles always have that special element to them. They are, uh, it, it, don't get me wrong, no one likes a good joint lock more than I do. But there has to be a special honorific role to, to strangle holds in the sport of jiu-jitsu. It goes deeper than that too, Bernardo. Um, you know, jiu-jitsu has another face to it too, which is self-defense. Yeah. And the beauty of strangle holds is that they offer you an incomparable versatility in severity of application okay um, when I go to apply a joint lock in a street fight you've only got one option you have to break the arm or the leg like if you get into a, a, a tough street fight with an opponent they don't know what a heel hook is they don't know what an arm lock is oh, yeah. all they know is their, their leg is hurting or their arm is hurting and they're gonna keep fighting you can't let go because you're in a fight yeah. and you're trying to win, you can't just let go and say, hey, I had you in an arm lock, he's gonna punch you right in the face. So you have to break the arm or the leg. There's no other option. There's no gentle application of a joint lock in a street fight. But strangle holds, first off, most of the best ones are applied from behind your opponent. So you already have a positional advantage. You're, you're pretty safe from there. It's hard for the guy to hit you successfully. Hard for them to bite you and do all the things that people often do in street fights. Um, and then when you go to strangle them, you can do so in a way which might be just intimidating. You put them in a strangle and let go. And they're like, oh my God, they felt terrible and they quit. Or if they're a tougher kind of opponent, you might just strangle them unconscious. Um, and then when they wake up, they might even fight a second time and do the same thing until eventually they figure it out and they, they, they cease and desist. Um, 
if it's a very severe street fight, you might strangle them unconscious to a point where they completely pass out and urinate on themselves or what have you. Sorry to be so free. Like completely break them down to a point where they wake up and they're incapable of fighting. They're just completely hammered. Um, that would be a more severe stranglehold held for a longer duration of time. And in a completely out of control situation where it was life or death, you can kill someone with a stranglehold. No one ever got killed by a heel hook, but every day, hundreds of Americans are killed by strangleholds. So you, you can run the full gamut of severity with strangleholds in a way you cannot do with joint locks. With joint locks, it's either all or nothing. And the degree of damage is limited. You break that particular joint. But if your opponent's tough, you can keep fighting with a broken arm. If there's weapons involved, you can still fight successfully with a broken leg. But with strangleholds, you can either make it very gentle or you can make it the most severe of all. You can make it life or death. No other submission hold has that kind of range of application. And yeah. so they, you have to award a special kind of honorific role for, for strangleholds in the sport of jiu-jitsu. They are the ultimate jiu-jitsu weapon. Yeah. Oh, John, I had one thing that I think is good about the strangles, that how dangerous, but in the same time, how safe it yeah. is, right? Because yeah. we, were, we were talking the other day, like... The safety record is incredible. Yeah, like how many people go to sleep, pass out, when they are in the strangles and there's no evidence yeah. that anybody doing that's grappling that. or yeah. judo or anything like that um, have died or, yeah. or even had get any symptoms after yeah, that that's right correct. um think about uh thankfully right um think about the sport of judo okay uh, the modern sport of judo began in 1882 and the the kodokan judo organization has kept excellent records uh, uh from the from the inception of, of their sport um, since 1882, there hasn't been a single record of someone dying of strangulation in competition or in training. Yep. That's I have a never long heard of time. Now stuff. think about the numbers of people who get strangled unconscious. Oh. I mean, we've both gone to sleep. You can put 10 or 15 so, times, yeah, God yeah. for me. <laughs> so, um, you know, this is a common thing. And yet, uh, no brain damage. I've never walked into a jiu-jitsu gym and seen people who look like they're yep. punchy. You go into a boxing gym, you, you see, see all the yeah, old yeah. people, they're, they're, you can't even have a conversation yeah. with them. Yeah. Um, uh, I've literally never seen that in Jiu Jitsu. Uh, I've literally every day of my life, uh, I see people getting strangled unconscious. It, it's yeah. literally a daily event. Um, no one's had any ill effects. It, it's, it's an incredibly safe method of operating. Um, the only time you'll hear about fatalities in the application of strangleholds is occasionally you'll hear people who, uh, during a violent police arrest, will pass away, usually as a result of uh, some kind of physical deformity or, or abnormality on the part of the person being strangled, or the use of an instrument, uh, such as a nightstick, where the larynx gets crushed yep. and fractured, and as a result, swelling occurs, which forms an actual, a real chokehold as opposed to a strangle, and occasionally people will die uh, as a result of that. But these are, um, these are either clumsily applied or inappropriately applied uh, attacks on the neck very different in nature from the, the safe strangleholds of jiu-jitsu. So you're absolutely right. The safety record in, in jiu-jitsu, judo, and all the other grappling sports too, is incredible for strangleholds. Uh, one of the most impressive things. So it's this incredible weapon that can range the full uh, gamut from very light to the most serious of all, life or death. Uh, and at the same time, it applied intelligently, has this incredible safety record. So it's, yeah, it's the uh, king of moves yeah. in jiu-jitsu. It's, it, it's the KO punch of jiu-jitsu. No, and, I agree. Uh, I think every student has a real obligation to make a deep study of strangleholds. It's, it's the number one weapon. Uh, the single, if we could only have yeah, one no weapon, be, absolutely, right? 100%. Yeah. Um, uh, that's why I'm so excited about this video because yeah. people already know the, the Nogi system that, that's yeah. been out for a while now. And I want people to know more about the, 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 the way we should strangle with the jacket on. There's a real science to it. And it's very different uh, as you saw oh, yeah. when we filmed yeah. it. It's, it's very different in, 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 uh, in, in operation from the Nogi system. So uh, fascinating stuff, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to its release. Yeah. So guys, uh, turtle breakdowns and strangles, part of the Go for the Fastest Fundamental series from John. It's gonna be at bjjfanatics.com soon. By maybe by the time you're watching, it's already there. So make uh, make sure to check that out. And thanks so much, John. My pleasure. Well, yeah. Thank you. Please help me out to grow my YouTube channel. Just click subscribe, and to watch more videos, just click under See More Videos. I hope you enjoyed.
BJJFanatics.com. Use the promo code YouTubeFaria to get 10% off any instructional video. Improve your jiu-jitsu faster. 